Okay, so it's almost time to get started. Uh, for those of you just joining in, please get settled in. Uh, remember to keep your mics on mute while uh, our speaker is talking. Uh, we'll have time for question and answers at the end. So for those of you that are a little bit new to us, this is the Collective Studio. Welcome. Um, new members especially. Uh, we are a design thinking community. We're here to help you out in uh, doing whiteboard challenges and design sprints. But outside of whiteboard uh, challenges and design sprints, we also host webinars like this where you can learn from professionals who are in the industry. And that's why we have Julieta here today, because she has an amazing story to share with you guys. Um, and before she gets started, just wanted to check uh, that you guys can find the text channel for this, this uh, uh, voice channel. Uh, if you click on the living room, you'll see a little icon with a speech bubble that will open up the text chat window. Once you do that, you could see the, uh, the text chat for this room. And uh, just give us a thumbs up if you can see everything. So far we got three thumbs up. Looks like uh, everyone is seeing your share screen. And yeah, it's almost time. I think uh, we could start maybe like 30 seconds early. Uh, thank you guys for, for being here. And I will let uh, Julieta, you know, start her presentation. Okay, hi. Ah, it's a bit early. Um, sorry, I wasn't sure if I had to turn my, my camera on or not. I, I think not, right? Uh, yeah, you can keep it off if you want to. It'll help with um, yeah, with less resources sure. as you're doing a share screen. Okay, that's great. Well, hi, my name is Julieta. I'm uh, from Argentina. Uh, this is my first time doing a presentation uh, outside of my work, so please be patient. <laughs> and let me know if there's any problem or if you can... Uh, see the slides. Um, everyone's here to help. So uh, a bit about today. Uh, I'm going to give a bit of an introduction about myself. I'm going to tell you a bit about my background. And then we're going to talk about uh, the juicy stuff, which is uh, going from translation to my first real UX role. And then we have some time for a Q&A session. So let's start. OK. So hi again, um, I'm Julieta, I'm a UX content designer from Argentina. Um, I have a background of uh, a bit more than nine years in the English and Spanish translation field. Um, my current role is a bit hybrid. I'm working as a UX writer, a UX designer and translator at a cybersecurity software as a service company, which is called Prey. Um, and sorry, let me move forward. And I'm going to tell you a bit about my background. Um, okay, so uh, being that my mother tongue is Spanish and that I've been bilingual for as long as I can remember, um, after finishing high school, the, the natural next step to me was uh, studying to get a bachelor's in translation and interpreting um, at university. And then in the meantime, I started working as a freelance translator. Um, I was able to, to participate in a wide variety of projects. Um, but I always felt like there was something missing there. Um, I felt that my university education was not helping me get any closer to the work experience that I actually wanted. Um, and what I, I think that uh, a common experience for us translators is that we're used to perceiving ourselves as being invisible um, because we're trained to kind of cover our traces and, and work in a way that no one can really tell we've been there. So in my case, this happened uh, not only with the texts that I that I delivered, but also at a, a internal work level. Um, I felt that my job was simply to receive, translate, and deliver, and, and there wasn't any exchange of ideas. Uh, I only had the, the communication uh, with the client, um, which also had a specific uh, set of rules, and, and there was not uh, a real exchange of ideas. Um, and there was no much room for my inputs or my suggestions. So I felt that my education, my expertise, my creativity were being uh, wasted. Um, after a while, this got more and more frustrating because I wanted to see uh, the whole journey of my texts. 
I wanted to be able to show my work online to because sometimes we have to um, remain anonymous. We, we cannot, as translators, we cannot uh, share freely uh, the translations we make most of the time because of NDA agreements. So um, it was a bit hard for me not, not to be able to to know or to see or recognize my own work because uh, most of the times after I, I I deliver them, I wasn't able to actually see what happened to them. So um, I wanted to to be able to improve the way my texts work in their own specific contexts. I wanted to be able to bring them to life in a different way. So uh, what happened was that sometimes I had uh, the most enjoyable experiences to me were, were the ones in which I could uh, maybe do some Q and A uh, or where I can get uh, my hands on um, text developer documents where I had to be very careful not to break the code. Um, and um, in those where I felt that I could do more than just like decode and, and disappear. So, so yeah, after some time of feeling stuck um, in my career, I came across something called UX. It blew my mind. Uh, I felt that this was my, my shot to get into technology without having to change my whole professional career uh, by maybe becoming a developer or, or a graphic designer. Uh, I did try to get into uh, developing and learning uh, something about programming, but I really didn't like it. I, I'm a linguistics girl, humanities girl. So um, I did tons of research. I searched for material. I read books. I got into communities like this one. Uh, listened to a lot of podcasts. I'm, I'm sure that uh, many of us uh, here did the same. Um, and then after that, I took a few kind of bootcamp courses on UX UI. And after that, I was able to become a tutor for, for those same, same um, courses that I had taken. Uh, so in this way, I felt that I was able to help new students the way my tutors help, helped me before. Um, and that was great. Um, then sorry I took to more specific but, writing. Sorry to interrupt, okay. but we're yes. only able to see the first slide. Did you? Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Just wanted to let you oh. know. Okay. Mm. Now we can see it. The background slide we could see. Oh, yeah. Okay. Can you see me moving from one to another? Uh, yeah, if this is the screen that we're on, then yeah, this is go good. Let, let me check. Mm, no, I think it's not moving. Yeah, now we see it moving. Now, we, now you can see the, the agenda. Mm -hmm. Yep. Is that right? You can see the agenda? Yes. We now can you see. should be able to see my... Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to move a bit slower, so... This can maybe work with me as I move. That's the first one, and that's the second one. Okay, so you are seeing what I'm seeing. Yes. Okay, so I hope this this, this doesn't happen again. <laughs> okay, so now you can yes, you can see the one. Okay. Um, so after taking more specific UX writing courses, uh, reading more specific books, creating a small portfolio with what I could, um, I started applying uh, for um, UX jobs. So in this slide, um, what I want to say is that yes, you can get into technology with a humanities background uh, because UX is about understanding people. Uh, humanities folks are people who understand people. So that's, I think, uh, a very uh, basic skill for UX, and I believe that we have it. Um, you don't have to be a technology person to be able to to work in technology, because I feel that uh, there's actually um, a need of humanities people within technology in order to make products more human. Uh, because sometimes uh, we realize that products are products are are not made or are not written by by writers, but rather by developers and um, that doesn't feel really natural or doesn't appeal to people. So um, when you're, it, it will, it will uh, probably be hard to make this kind of transition because it's difficult to find the common points at first, but I promise that your input is incredibly valuable for like industry. So uh, what happened to me was that one of the difficulties that I uh, had when I first started applying for UX roles was that interviewers didn't understand my career switch. 
Uh, many of them uh, consider it to be like a sharp pivot, but to me, this was like the natural next step in my professional development. Um, I had the linguistic knowledge, I had the, the linguistic expertise, I was already obsessed with typos and grammar rules, um, and I knew that uh, that was like uh, the, the, the basic skill set that I needed in order to be a great UX writer. I just needed to uh, make my story match to the UX, to the UX roles that I was applying for. Um, and I, of course, uh, after learning about UX, uh, I, I, I felt that my, my uh, professional uh, profile was very, was very complete and very, um, and very well prepared. So um, as regards interviews, I feel that your storytelling must explain how your experience is a match um, with the UX. Uh, you have to find those common points because uh, they're, uh, your your experience is valuable, uh, no matter from which field you come from. Check if you're seeing the next one. I think you're not seeing the next one. Uh, why why doesn't this move? <laughs> okay. There we go. We could see. Let it. me check. My friends with rejection. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. I don't know, I'm, 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 this is the first time I'm using Gamba and it's working a bit slower than I want. Okay, so, so um, which the interview part bring, brings me to this. Um, this is about uh, owning your story and journey, um, describing with interviewers how your past experiences shaped you into the UX designer or writer that you are today. Um, and being able to explain the impact you can make uh, and the value you can bring to an organization. Um, so what I want to, uh, to tell you is that you will definitely get rejected time and time again. Um, but if you're not sure that you fulfill all the requirements, you should apply anyway. In any case, you'll not be moving forward, but every chance you don't take is a missed opportunity to get closer to where you want to be. Um, so be okay with it, with rejection. Um, for your first applications, this will feel awful, but it will become more and more commonplace over time. Um, my advice is that you uh, try to get used to this and use these rejections as learning experience. Um, because after getting rejected, uh, you can um, adjust your interview uh, preparation and portfolio for the next time. Um, Maybe uh, if you didn't get the first interview, that will be a bit harder because you're going to work on it um, by yourself. But if you get to a first interview, uh, by the way, congratulations if you happen to, um, you can write everything down, uh, what you felt uh, was not going great during your conversation with the interviewer. If you got stuck at one point, if there was a specific question that, that was hard uh, for you to answer, um, you can write a all that down and, and, and work on that and make adjustments and then just go back to the applying. And this will get easier. Um, you'll realize that you, you'll get better each time that you do it. So uh, don't be afraid of rejection. It's really, um, it's really the only way uh, to get to where you want to be and to get a, a job and in UX. Um, because uh, what happened to me was that I, I felt scared to even uh, apply for the positions. And what I've learned um, is that women are more um, are more scared to apply for roles that they don't feel prepared for um, because they feel that if they are not 100% uh, prepared, uh, they 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 just can't apply. So my advice as a woman <laughs> coming from humanities uh, and getting into technology um, a short time ago, uh, I would say that just apply and if you get rejected, it will happen. It, it's okay and uh, life goes on, but you will be more prepared for the next time. Let me see, okay, yes. Um, okay, so as regards, um, before, before uh, switching to UX and before transitioning, um, I wanted to um, be aware of some questions to ask yourself um, because maybe I think we kind of uh, idealize uh, UX. We think that it's the perfect um, profession, that it's uh, amazing, and of course it is in many ways, but 
you also have to try to uh, understand if it's uh, great for you because it's not great for everyone. Um, so here are some questions. Um, do you prefer to work on your own mostly? Do you feel like having a lot of meetings isn't uh, right for you? Do you prefer to work on one subject or project rather than many at a time? Do you find problem solving stressful? Do you consider yourself to be a natural learner? Do you find having to explain your decisions frustrating? If you feel identified with most of uh, this, this, um, this uh, questions, I would, um, I would advise you to rethink uh, if this is the right career for you because um, you need to feel uh, comfortable with this kind of job. It involves uh, different working methodologies that you might not choose for your professional life. Like for example, working in different uh, teams, uh, interdisciplinary teams, working in sprints, um, iterating your work multiple times. So I would advise you to get a sense of where you want to be in the future, uh, what aspects of UX you enjoy or are related to your previous experience and can maybe align to your current job search. And uh, keep in mind that in the, uh, in the way that we learn in boot camps, it all feels very um, ideal and we feel that we are going to be 100% um, working on uh, user goals and on making the user experience better and that's uh, a reality. But you also have to take into consideration that you're going to be working uh, for a company that also has business goals in mind. So you have to um, keep in mind that uh, you have to be uh, balancing those two things all the time. And if you're not comfortable with that, um, you might have to reconsider. Okay. Let me see. Oh, this is so slow. Or you should be seeing the yellow slide. Sorry, I there is oh, I hit sorry. <laughs> okay. Um so I'm going to tell you a bit about my own experience uh with my first role. Um, um I made a few uh notes for you to take into consideration because um I realized that our experience may differ because of our context. Um, but of course, there are core aspects that will possibly repeat for most jobs. So as regards my own experience, this is my first UX job. Um, this is based on my uh, year and a half experience working at a small software as a service company from Chile. Um, we're working fully remotely for more parts, all parts of the world, but we are a Latin American team, so we communicate uh, in Spanish within our, our company. And we work with agile methodologies in a startup-like environment and with a horizontal organization, which means that I can um, ask questions maybe uh, to the CEO if I have uh, a doubt and I don't have to like um, go through all the bureaucratic steps in order to get to the CEO. So that's pretty cool. Okay, so... Um, Again, uh, talking about a small company or startup, uh, if, you're, if, you're, um, if your first job is at a small company or startup, you might be needed on multiple fronts. Um, this can feel weird if your ultimate professional goal is to specialize in a niche role, like for example, UX writing or UX research, um, and you only want to do that. But um, the truth is that you'll gain a lot of amazing experience by working at a small company that allows you to be a part of many different projects and do many different things. So um, the main takeaways are that you will get real world experience and learn what you like best because you'll be able to try many different things and to uh, maybe be able to choose for the future what you, what you prefer, uh, what, you're, um, well, what you want to specialize on later on. Um, you can also see growth inside or outside of your company. Maybe inside of your company, you can um, look for a mentor, look for um, someone who is, who's doing uh, a career path similar to what you want to do. Um, so you can get advice, you can get feedback, you can ask questions, or also outside because there are a lot of, of resources um, to have uh, maybe uh, some short uh, calls with, with people you want to, to um, 
to interview, to ask questions to, and, and there's a lot of, of material up there. And um, what, would ha what will happen after this is that you'll be an eligible employee with more opportunities. Um, in my experience, what happens in small companies is that you have to know or do a bit of everything. Maybe in bigger companies, this is not the case and you uh, can specialize uh, a lot more. But I feel that this year and a half, I've been doing so many different things uh, that I really enjoyed um, being able to work on, on many different projects and uh, in a lot, lot of a lot of different uh, with a lot of different hats. So this has been great. Then, sorry, let's see. Oh my God, this is hard. Okay, I hope it, I hope it moves at one point. Okay, that's it. Um, okay, so um, your imposter syndrome is lying to you. Um, I wanted to to take some time to talk about this because uh, it happened to me that that uh, I felt like a like a failure or a fake. Um, so my advice is that you should feel confident about your knowledge and expertise, and uh, really believe that. If they hire you, they did it for a reason. Um, it's not that you're winging it, winging it, or actually everyone is kind of doing that. But once you realize no one really knows everything, you'll feel uh, a lot freer, freer to work. Um, what I could uh, see within my own company is that maybe my own leader um, was also struggling with the, the same uh, feelings, uh, imposter feelings like I was. Uh, or maybe the CEO of the company was also feeling stuck uh, with an impossible problem. So once I realized that this was happening uh, for people that, that had much more experience than I did, um, I felt relieved because I I understood that uh, that everyone has this problem and I was able to put it aside and, and move on. Um, and also, um, I would say that you'll never feel fully prepared, so you just have to do it. Um, it still happens to me. Well, this is the first time I'm presenting for uh, people outside uh, of my <laughs> of my work uh, circle. So, I uh, you're you you're never going to feel fully prepared for presentations or for whatever. So I'm just constantly taking leaps of faith, and most of the times it turned out well. Um, but either way, uh, if it doesn't, uh, I've always kept uh, learning from my my good or my bad experiences. Okay, um, so this is something that I really like about my company. Uh, it's being able to see that I'm helping simplify the user's journey through our product. It's actually something beautiful because uh, it brings me peace of mind. Um, but uh, this also means that you have to let go of your ego and think of your work as something uh, rather collective. Um, I'm not saying that you can be proud of your work. Uh, that's very important too, in order to Keep yourself motivated, but keep in mind that it's not your baby anymore. And if, for example, uh, the, the data team says that your users will prefer a different solution from the one that you crafted, you have to just let go and uh, move forward with the other um, the other solution. So uh, the key points here would be honor your role, let uh, leave your ego at the door, and think uh, that you're working for people and that there's someone that will actually be using uh, the solutions that you propose. So keep those people in mind at all times. Okay, I'm sorry about that. It, it just keeps happening. Yeah, no problem. Take your time. <laughs> I just say it. I get so anxious. But I don't know why it's doing it. Okay, there it is. Okay, um, so as I said, your past experience is valuable, so you should see it as a strength. Uh, and there's always common ground between disciplines. Um, sometimes what happened to me was that I felt um, a bit embarrassed that I didn't uh, come from maybe graphic design or, or some other more related um, career path. Um, 
but I realized that everyone has uh, different um, different journeys towards UX. And once I realized that, I was able to to really embrace my own. So I'll tell you a bit about. Okay. So. Okay, so um, once you start, maybe I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, for, for juniors here. Um, when you first start uh, at, at your first job, um, you should really own your work. Um, this means being aware of your mistakes and uh, acknowledge them openly um, because there's no way that you do everything right every time, even more if it's your first UX job. Uh, and also keep in mind that your new coworkers don't expect you to. So feel free to come clean about what you know or you don't know, or if you feel that you've made a mistake but are too embarrassed to admit it. Um, because uh, what happened to me sometimes was that I felt this way and not being honest about these things uh, sometimes led to a lot of unnecessary anxiety because uh, I felt that I uh, should be able to do something or that I should know something already. Uh, but this is not the case. Everyone is constantly learning, and of course, you are just um, you're just starting out uh, and learning uh, about a new a new product or your new company. And you just have to to be gentle with yourself and to move slowly because uh, th these things will uh, feel easier over time. You just have to give yourself the time to do that. Um, so, yes, so um, this uh, also brings me to learning to say no um, and only do what you have to do, which, could, which can seem uh, pretty obvious, but at least I know that I found it hard to balance between trying to prove that I was a hard worker and that I was uh, good at my job and feeling overwhelmed by all the unnecessary tasks that I said yes to. Um, you can do everything yourself, and it's uh, best to learn to share responsibilities with your teammates before you end up with uh, burnout. Um, you need to take care of your health so you are able to deliver your best work. Um, so my advice here is don't overdo it and have clarity on what is asked of yourself and commit to that. If afterwards you can uh, take on uh, more tasks that you committed to uh, in the first place, that's great, uh, but um, just uh, feel feel confident enough to start to say no uh, because you don't have to be everywhere at all times. Okay, great. Um, then another thing that I've learned this last year and a half is that there's no such thing as a perfect design. There's always a better version of a previous one, and that's the beauty of UX. You'll constantly be finding things to improve and new ways to address the user's needs in a more comprehensive way. So I would say come to terms with good enough content or design. Of course, do your best uh, at all times, but keep in mind that uh, you cannot uh, iterate forever. You have to deliver at one point. <laughs> try, try not to be a perfectionist, which, I, which is something that I'm also uh, sometimes struggle with. And that as there's no such thing as a finished design. Which brings me to, if the slide is with me, it is not, okay. Sorry, I will keep saying sorry. <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of curious, um, are you able to display this presentation in your web browser? Uh, I think it is. It is on my web browser. Okay. Oh yeah, it's on Google Chrome. Uh, I, I, I see. Okay. Okay, okay. it's there. Okay. Um, okay so um, another uh, very useful advice is to be okay with change in your own design, in your core team, in your current project, and in your uh, working processes. This has been challenging for me sometimes. Again, this is my experience in a small company. Maybe this isn't the case in larger ones, but there's zero chance that your uh, job in UX will always be the same. And that's pretty cool if you, ask, if you ask me, but it can also be tricky to keep up with the fast changes and not feeling discouraged. So um, 
picture having uh, a project to work on, dedicating your energy, time, and effort to complete your part as best as possible for maybe a month. Uh, you're confident that you've been doing a great job with your colleagues and that the new feature uh, or change will bring value to the users. And all of a sudden, your team leader tells you to uh, tells you that the feature won't be moving forward for now and that you'll put your efforts on a different project. Um, so I won't lie, it does feel uh, frustrating at first and it feels like you've wasted your time for nothing. But it happens all the time and you have to be prepared to toss your work and to start over. So my advice here is to take your opportunity as a learning one because you're actually becoming a better designer each time and getting your work implemented or not doesn't define your worth as a designer. Um, you're doing valuable things even if no one can see, uh, can see them implemented in the end. Um, so the next one would be working on your communication and self-esteem. Um, you'll have to sometimes, well, all of the time, so you have to defend your work. So you need to be able to um, articulate your work process and decisions. You need to be able to explain why you think uh, uh, one solution is better than the other uh, in order to solve a specific problem. And you will have to understand who you're talking to, what they need from you, and only talk about what's relevant for them. For example, it's not the same to explain your decisions to a person doing your same job than to a team leader or to someone from the marketing or sales team or to a developer. So uh, my advice here is that you try to spend some time really trying to, um, to learn uh, how each of their job processes are in order to present your proposals better and to get your solutions, solutions forward. You need to understand what part of your work will affect the others and what each person uh, needs from you. You can obviously be a naturally great communicate, communicator or an extroverted person, but this is something that just take, takes practice. So don't be afraid of feedback. Um, when working with stakeholders, set boundaries, ask for comments uh, on specific aspects of your work. And this means different people will give you different pieces of feedback. Uh, and this will be feedback related to different parts of your work. So. In my uh, personal experience, I found it very hard when I started my job. Internally, I took some of the opinions personally because I felt that my self-worth as a designer or writer was being questioned. And my advice here would be to think of it like this. People are just uh, looking out for their jobs and their job includes challenging the design solutions to ensure that everything aligns with everyone's needs. Um, so in the same way, in the same way, when asking for feedback, be as specific as possible so as not to get a bunch of unrequested opinions. For example, you can say, I need your comments on a specific, this, this specific part of my proposal. Okay, so this relates to balancing user needs and stakeholders' requests. Um, okay, uh, here my advice is to try to anticipate stakeholders' concerns and questions, evangelize UA, UX in all its forms, and give uh, stakeholders visual ideas like wireframes, prototypes, and so on, um, because this way you'll be um, able to um, persuade, in a way, um, your stakes uh, the, the stakeholders to uh, move forward with your idea. Let me see. Okay, uh, which is also related to always showing the value of UX. So uh, time to think business. Um, our job is to keep users or customers happy enough to keep coming, or at least not to live on their first experience with our product. If our product is not usable, if the copy is confusing or ambiguous, if our users don't feel like their expectations and needs are met, they will simply leave. There's plenty of competition out there, so you have to, to think, really think of who are you working for when you're writing or where you're designing? So here's a very uh, important tip. Uh, work closely with the data team and be curious about how good or bad UX can be reflected on data uh, graphs. Bad UX also means more wasted money because you could be developing the wrong idea. Um, and in fact, doing research in the early stages, including a deeper analysis of users' behavior, analyzing all the possible user flows and edge cases would, would lead to less friction to prioritize 
to make decisions and to plan releases. It also means that the efforts of the company are not simply arbitrary decisions, but rather well thought business choices. So uh, the key takeaways are that a good UX sells more, happy customers are returning customers, disappointed customers means less sales, and um, early stage uh, research leads to clear prioritization, easier decision making, and release planning. And then, lastly, um, it is also very important, um, document your work all the time. This is something that I'm still working on, to be honest, but I know it's uh, valuable advice. Don't trust your memory, write everything down. You might think that you will remember later, but you probably won't. Uh, document your projects while they're fresh in your mind, if possible, while, while you're working on them. Write down about all those amazing aha moments, conversation with uh, key colleagues, insights, changes and everything you find interesting about your current project um, because you will have valuable material for your portfolio. Um, this means that you can prepare uh, a portfolio which includes uh, a description of the problem, uh, a bit about the context of the company, um, uh, a short description of, of the users, who the stakeholders were, um, which of the time or resources constraints you had, challenges and how you approach them. So as you move forward, uh, you can add results and any new changes that you make, but you'll be able to present um, your work in a very compelling way um, by, by explaining uh, every, everything you, you came across uh, through your, through your um, project. So to finish, to sum up, let me see if this works. I hope it does. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so my advice is just take the plunge. Sometimes UX will feel like this uh, and enjoy the ride. So. Thank you I hope so you saw much. It. Let, me, let, let me know if you didn't see it. <laughs> I. I saw the video. It was so cute. <laughs> the kids on the teacup. Okay, okay. Is that like Disneyland? Oh my gosh, it's funny. Yeah, thank you so much, check. Julieta, for sharing your talk and and um, going through some very key points about how to approach career switching. Uh, does I think this is a, a good time to do a bit of Q and A. Does anyone have any questions or any kind of feedback or or if you want to say thank you, do you feel free to unmute your mics and uh, let us know what you're thinking. Okay, I see, I see some people typing in the chat, so I think we might have some questions coming your way. Hypathia says thank you. You're welcome, Hypathia. Um, for me, I, I found myself agreeing with a lot of the points that you were saying, especially about soft skills, because I think there's a lot of emphasis for d uh, UX designers when they're learning to get a grasp of Figma, to get a grasp of layout and color and typography, and all that stuff is great, right? When it comes to coming up with new UI designs and designing things that are beautiful and functional, it's great to have that, but if you just have wireframes and you don't have a way to express like, what is the purpose of this? What is it helping us to solve a problem? Then it ceases to become UX, right? Because it's not enough just to have wireframes and to have a good layout. Um, there needs to be a purpose, there needs to be a problem, and there needs to be some kind of insight, really digging deep into the user's behavior so that we can actually make use of those wireframes. So I think it's pretty yeah. like important for designers to talk about their work because in the job, maybe people haven't uh, experienced working as a designer before, but a lot of it is going to be communicating mm -hmm. and you're going to be in meetings with yeah. people like developers. Sometimes developers might shoot down your idea and you might think, oh my God, mm -hmm. why are they hating me? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so <laughs> it's important yeah, to like- Yeah, it happens. Yeah, exactly. I could relate. Um, so it's really important to like 
meet with the people that are going to be helping to build out these solutions. Talk to developers, ask them questions about how they do their jobs as well, because that will also inform Definitely. you of how to like design better. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. So there's um, some messages for you, Julieta. I'm going to read them out. Okay. One from Cody right. the Kid. Uh, they said, I've been a tattoo artist for about five years now. I work one-on-one -on -one with designing every day with my clients. Would I be able to transfer that experience to UX UI design, even though it's not tech? Mm. Yes, I would say, yeah. Um, because on the one hand, you might have uh, the design part uh, covered. Of course, maybe you have to learn some uh, specific uh, tools like Figma or other uh, tools that you need to, to design to do the, the UI part. But if you've been working with people, I think that a lot of, of what UX means is covered. Of course, um, there's always uh, a need to learn more about what UX is, some specific methodologies, uh, some, some specific uh, terms and, and how, how UX works. But I think that uh, being able to, to deal with people is, is a very important skill that, that, that's super necessary. And, and if you don't like people, you'll find it very hard to, to be able to empathize and to actually think what people's problems are and how to solve them. So I think that, uh, you, you probably are very empathic, empathetic, I think it's empathetic and, um, that you you also have that. Uh, ability to talk to people and maybe that could also be good for, I don't know, maybe if you're more interested in the UX research uh, point of view. Uh, I think, yeah, yeah, I think there are a lot of, of skills that you can transfer for, for, for your, from your experience. Yeah. And I also agree that like, if you're a tattoo artist, it's like, I've, I've gone to art school and I've definitely I uh, have been studying with people who studied illustration with me that also went on to become tattoo artists. And yeah, it is a very important thing to be always in close communication with whoever you're working with. So if you definitely know how to talk to your customers, you could definitely um, leverage your communication skills and apply it to UX and UI design. It's obviously going to be a little bit different because the topic is going to be different and, you know, the constraints and also the budgeting kind of... Um, I guess constraints are different than ha talking to a customer that just wants a tattoo of like a star on their wrist, you know? So it, it, <laughs> it it's, it's going to be different, but you could definitely leverage like your, your creative ability and your communication skills in UX. And Claffy says, that was really useful. Thank you so much. I switched careers last year to content design and have realized how many of the skills were transferable. Yeah, that's a really uh, good insight. Um, Hypathia says, is ageism a thing in the tech field? I'm over 35. I am planning to move into the tech field. Should I worry about my age? Oh my gosh. Like yeah, Hypathia, mm. I'm, I'm 35. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just turned 30. And so I would say no. Um, also it will, of course it will depend on, on the company, on the specific industry. Maybe some industries are more, um, are more uh, used to working with younger people, but I think that it's not it's not the case. Uh, in my company, for example, there are people who's been working there for around 10 years and who are around, I don't know, 50, 45, 30, 25. Um, I think what's important is to show what you what you can do uh, and to and to show how your experience relates to UX and what uh, specific or different um, value or skill set you can you can bring to the table and that's it um and, and also i mean uh being older also means that you will probably have more experience uh in whatever field you've worked on so uh i can imagine that you probably been working on, on something on i mean i mean you probably have have or have had a job so um thinking uh about that i think age could also be uh an advantage that many young young people don't have. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I think quite the opposite. Yeah, I think with the whole ageism thing, it's such a broad thing because I've heard of people who sure. um, have been mothers and they've been out of the industry for like many years looking after their kids and when they get back 
into employment, then they've struggled because, you know, they've missed out on, on career opportunities, right? It's really complicated and it really depends on the person, uh, depends on circumstances, depends on where you are at your career. But if you were working and you did not take a career uh, break for children and uh, you're 35 and you're a woman, I don't think there should be an issue. Um, however, if you are older, like in your 50s, 60s, that could be a case of like, I don't know what that's like. Like, I'm, I, no one here uh, right now in our audience is that age, so we really don't know if there's any kind of barriers. Uh, if you're, um, let's just say, uh, the age of your parents, for example, jumping into UX design for the first time, I really don't know. But for now, uh, Hypath, yeah, I think you're good. I think we're, we're in a very advantageous position to do a lot of things at our age. Um, Ivana yeah, says... Sure. Havana says, thank you very much for the presentation, Julia, or Julieta. Uh, since I talked to you about how you started your UX career for my sister-in-law, remember? Oh, okay. I think she knows you. Yeah, um, yeah. I started yeah, being curious. Yeah, from college. Yeah. I started being curious about this path as a translator. So I really appreciate the knowledge and all the tips that you shared. It really opened my mind. That's so nice. Thank you. I'm a bit uh, embarrassed, but that's so nice to read. Yeah. And um, Cody the Kid says, thank you. It's nerve-wracking switching careers. This webinar gave me a little bit of confidence in my decision. I'm glad. I'm so happy that that happened. Oh, that's so nice. Yeah. That's so nice. I I'm, I'm glad too, because uh, even though I'm, I'm, I just turned 30, I, I felt the same way many times. Uh, like I was stuck and that it wasn't... Uh, exploring uh, the possibilities that I had uh, or that I could have been doing. Um, so yeah, it, it's nice to know that there's a possibility that, that you you can always try and, and do new stuff. Okay, and then Claffy says, Hypathia, I was 50 this year and as a new UXer have found it that life experience is yes. valued in the field, go for it. Okay. Wicked. Yes, definitely. That that was my point. Yes, definitely. You you probably have something so valuable to bring to the table uh, that many younger people can't. So I would take advantage of that, and I would uh, try to find a way to to express that ideas uh, and your and your experience in, in a way that it's valuable for for the user uh, experience business. Uh, so I I will also say that you should maybe try to learn more about. Uh, how businesses work. Uh, that's also very useful because, um, well, I talk about uh, being like um, working on many different um, uh, sides of, of, of the project, mm -hmm. but I would also say that I learned a lot about how business works. And uh, I think it's very important because there's always this need to, to be able to, to talk to your uh, stakeholders or the product owner um, they will always uh, let you know a bit more. So I think that you have to take advantage of that and to talk to people who have a more uh, big picture thinking. Uh, and I think that's very valued in the US uh, industry. Yeah, I would have to say when I was uh, a college student, you know, I, I didn't really know how to measure like the value that I would bring to a company. So if you're graduating from like a boot camp or a design school, um, just be prepared to be surprised when um, you realize that your unique vision and your style is not always appreciated in, in the jobs that you do. So it's really important to separate yourself from your work. Um, that's mm -hmm. a case where when you are designing for the customer, um, and there's a design system that a company is already using. Respect the design system, respect the process. Um, don't take it personally if your ideas don't make it. You're trying to create value for the user. And at the end of the day, if you design pathways for the user that they could uh, you know, solve their problems and they're happy, then that's what makes you like an effective and, and a really good designer. Um, it also helps to be um, looking for jobs that are a match to your kind of specific experiences because obviously if, if you have a lot of experience and you're applying to jobs where 
perhaps they're only hiring juniors or perhaps they're hiring for a specific type of person in mind. Um, make sure you're aligning with the goals of the company and, and you're part of a, a, a company culture that embraces you. So if you mm. had a career break, yeah. let's just say if you're a woman, you've had a career break, definitely align with companies that are okay with that, that they understand that people are at different points in their lives and they see that as a valuable uh, benefit. Um, other mm -hmm. than that, do we have any more questions or any messages for Julieta? Okay, so Cody the Kid says... No, so, sorry, could I say just one more yeah, thing? Yeah, sure, no problem. Um, if you're starting out, because it happened to me, if you're starting out and you uh, just want to get that first UX job, you will probably feel that the best way to do it is like applying to everything that comes your way, uh, no matter what, what it is or what the company looks like, or if you actually feel that you would be a good fit uh, in that company. And I would say, please don't do that because I, I tried to do that. And I realized that there's not only, um, I mean, up applying and getting interviews is not only an, a one-way path in which you have to convince the interviewers to hire you, but it's also an opportunity to get to know how you will be working in the future for that company. So if you feel that something is sort of uh, weird, you get a weird vibe when you're talking to the interviewer, or you realize that you're not uh, feeling very comfortable talking to them, um, listen to you, to your gut and, and don't, don't continue on that, on that road because it's very likely that you will end in a company that doesn't value the way you, you want to, or which it's not, um, it's not natural to your way of working and you will probably not have a great opportunity, a great uh, experience in the long run. So try to, to see interviews as opportunities to see like if you are both a match, like the company is a match for you and you are a match for the company. Uh, think of it uh, as a relationship and not only as uh, someone you have to convince to hire you. I think that's very important. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, at the interview stage, interview the employer. They're interviewing you, you can interview them right back. Um, sure. And also, yeah. when it comes to networking as well, if you want to know if the, the kind of culture of the team is aligned with who you are as a person, you could also talk to people that work at that company and be like, hey, you're a UX designer mm -hmm. at this company. What's it like working there? Um, are they, you know, accepting of, of differences? Like, you know what I mean? Like, just try to find out in other ways to see if you're actually like a match for that job and then do uh yeah like maybe have a coffee chat with someone who's either a hiring manager or a designer at that company that's also another way to get yourself into employment and also claffles also says uh glass door is a good way to check out companies yeah yes. definitely um definitely pay scale and glass door are great pay scale is great because you get to find out what the average salary is at certain companies as well as figure out what your salary expectations are and then Glassdoor is great to find out what other people think of the company especially if they left and they didn't like it you will find out exactly what's wrong mm -hmm. and what's going right at that company as well um yeah cody the kid says uh that was my biggest surprise going into tattooing i spend more time doing what other people want more than what you want to do um mm -hmm. I have some feedback on that as well, because I've been a graphic designer for freelance like over seven years. And there's a difference between working as an in-house designer versus working at an agency. So if you work at a creative agency, you're gonna do a lot more creative work. Whereas if you work for a corporation, you're gonna be limited in, in your creativity. And it's probably because if you're working within a company, they have their own style guide, their own brand rules. However, if you work at an agency, there's an opportunity to work on different projects for different clients and the level of creativity mm -hmm. might be high. So if you are a part of a team where you're making something new and you're doing inventive, I don't know, name it, like it could be like an AR project or it could be a totally interactive 3D kind of experience, immersive experience. You could be doing all sorts of things with an agency, right? So if you want to be a product designer at an agency, you might find that the, the projects that you do are more ambitious and maybe your, your creative style could definitely, um, you know, align with what the team does. 
So if you want to find more creative jobs where you want to put more of your personality into it, you could definitely apply to agencies. But, you know, it's also difficult to work in agencies as well because they tend to be quite close knit. So it's based on who mm. you know. So it helps to kind of do a lot of networking and, and talk to people who work at agencies if you want to work at one. Um, but that's just my bit of advice. Okay, so do we have any more questions for Julieta? Feel free to unmute if you feel comfortable talking. Otherwise, you can use the text chat. Sorry, while I'm here, uh, I just wanted to also say, <laughs> because I'm coming up with new things, um, that if you get to, to an interview stage, um, also try to, try to um, ask, uh, the right questions, for example, like who is going to be your core team? Who are you going to be working with? Like in the most, um, in the most um, day to day basis, uh, because it's also going to let you know how the, the company works and what the structure of the company is. Um, and it will help you learn more about what your day to day work would look like and who are you going to have to we were going to have to talk to and to uh, work with and to maybe develop a, an idea or a solution. So it's it's good to to ask what your your actual team will look like because, for example, um, I work closely with the UI designer and with a developer. But there's also I'm, I'm my role is also embedded within a, a, a bigger product and UX team. So. You have to learn to work uh, in multidisciplinary uh, groups of people and to understand what what each person brings to the table and what um, what parts of their uh, roles would be useful for your own job. Um, because, for example, I can have ideas that cannot be made uh, a reality, so I have to be able to talk to the developer and to ask, hey, would this be... Uh, possible to do or is it this just crazy um, and also with a UI designer to see if I don't know this button here would look okay because uh, in a way every uh, aspect of your work also depends on someone else's so it's like a, a puzzle every piece comes together in a, in a specific way um, and you can of course there are a lot of constraints because you have to to keep all of this uh, uh, things into consideration, but also the business uh, goals. So it, it sometimes it can be tricky, but I think it's very nice to be able to work with a team and to understand um, how each, uh, each of their minds work in a way. Uh, and I feel it's very uh, fulfilling and it's, it's great. Uh, it's a great nurturing uh, experience for you also as a professional. Okay, and I think we have some messages coming in, so we're just waiting. All right. Okay, remember, you can also unmute if you like. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, so McMuffin Man says, not a question, but advice for juniors. <clears throat> Listen up. If you're presenting your portfolio during an interview, make sure to ask for portfolio feedback after the interview. This shows the interviewers that you're willing to learn and that's the biggest green flag that you can have. I've done this for four interviews for a higher UX position while I was a junior and got a call back from all of them for a second round. Okay. Good advice. Absolutely. But also, mm -hmm. but also know that sometimes they won't be answering just Keep that in mind and don't feel frustrated. 
Yeah, that's happened to me before as well. After interviews, sometimes you don't get feedback. And yeah. the true nature is, is that, you know, with employment and hiring, things move quickly. So if they found mm -hmm. someone that they think is more ideal and more aligned with, um, they might not have any feedback for anyone that they've rejected. You might not even know. And also another yeah, area sure. of contention. It's also a lot of people lying. Yes, definitely. Another area of a contention that I didn't realize, I was talking about this with a, with some other um, you know, business owners and non-designers, but they also said that from the HR position, um, there could be issues where if they give you too much feedback about why you didn't get a job, um, that could be used against them if you want to sue the company for uh, discrimination. And the reason why they sometimes don't give feedback, even if they could, is for the reason that they are seen as liable. So they don't want to give you feedback that is too negative that you might start to maybe perhaps question whether there's some ethical grounds that are being um, crossed. But most companies, I know that if, if they have a good communication with you and they seem to think that you're honest or whatever, they'll take the chance and give you feedback. Other times, it's quite often that they won't give feedback and it could be to do with the fact that if they tell you that they didn't, that you didn't get the job, uh, they don't want you to think that it's a issue of ethics uh, being uh, undermined. So yeah, I didn't know that either because I, I thought it was so unfair that like, hey, how come I'm being rejected all this time and they're not even tell me, telling me that even when I ask them for feedback. Um, so yeah, mm -hmm. you can ask for feedback, definitely ask. However, if you don't get an answer and it ends up being like like a lot, like let's say you apply to like 300 jobs and you didn't get feedback from any of the interviews you had, um, don't worry. Like there, that's something that you can't control. Just keep moving forward. Yeah, and, and try, to, try to adjust your portfolio or your, uh, or your interview kind of script or presentation. Uh, because sometimes if you don't even get to an interview stage, it might mean that your uh, CV is not as well presented as you want to, or your portfolio has some issues. So I would say that each time you you don't hear back from from a company, or uh, each time you get rejected, just mm. keep on adjusting your your own uh, mm -hmm. your, your the things that you already have. Right, right, and and same thing with interviews. If you go through an interview and you felt like hmm, something's not right, it's time to like reflect, think about what went right in the interview. And if you think there's something that you could change, um, definitely do the work and, and practice and definitely look over your resume and kind of ask mm -hmm. yourself, like, why didn't this work out? Well, maybe, you know, I didn't format this properly or maybe there was a spelling mistake. So definitely try to catch your own yeah. issues before and also, <laughs> trying again. And also, sorry, I just remember something quite funny. Mm -hmm. And also, um, just uh, come to terms with the fact that recruiters sometimes don't understand what UX design actually is mm -hmm. and what you're going to be doing. So there's some uh, job posts that are like a mixture between developing, uh, graphic designing, UX designing. I don't know. There's a lot of, of things going on there and, and try to, to understand if, if what they are asking is what you can give them. Because at one point I had an interview uh, that said they wanted a UX designer. So I, I I had an interview and everything was going great, but then they told me that they needed a graphic designer and some other things. And I and I and I had to actually educate them on what UX designing was and that I wasn't a graphic designer. So mm -hmm. of course that, that didn't uh, that didn't uh, advance, of course, but try to try to understand what, what they need, ask as many questions as possible to to understand if the, your uh, abilities is that that the same that they're needing because sometimes it happens. Yeah, that actually reminds me of an interview that I had. I, I read the ad and it sounded like it was a graphic design job. <laughs> yeah. And I had that background experience, but then after I got on the interview, um, I realized that they were looking for someone who was more uh, into the print production process like actually working with the machines to print mm. out graphics and that's a different area of skill set so yes i know how to use adobe acrobat and, and illustrator but most of the job will be handling the printing press and i'm like that's not 
a graphic designer's job. <laughs> that's that's to do with print production. Like that's totally different. So yeah, it can happen where you know they use the title incorrectly, but definitely ask questions uh, if you have the ability to, if you're able to. Sometimes employers are not easily reachable. You find an ad, uh, and there's no email address that you can refer to. But if they do get back to you, um, even before the interview, you might want to ask questions like, hey, you know, what kind of, you know, like, ish, like job this is? I don't know. But like, if, <laughs> if something seems um, miss, like it seems incorrect, or it seems, you know, dodgy, then definitely ask the question if it doesn't seem um, concise. Mm. Other than that, if, if it says UX design, and it looks like a UX design role, I would have trust that they do know what they're talking about and just go through with it. Anywho, yeah. um, Stephen Wood oh, there's says, a comment. Yeah. yeah, Stephen Wood says, sometimes I find it hard for UX and UI to get on the same page. Teamwork mm -hmm. is important, but quite hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That... yeah, definitely. Yeah, it happens, but you also have to, um, I think what's important is to have an open mind in these cases, because, um, if you can get on the same page, it, it can be because everyone's like trying to do their jobs in the best possible way, um, but they are not uh, collaborating. In a way. So I think that's very important. And if you, of course, if you're having, a, uh, if this is like a repeating problem, it's a pattern that you can really talk uh, to UX and UI and get uh, an agreement. You should also report it to someone who, who can uh, maybe ask as a, as a mediator, as a moderator, um, because this should be um, more collaborative, and this should like flow, you know, in a in a more natural way. This this um, this shouldn't be like, oh well, I'm trying to convince you that my part of the job is more important than yours, but it should actually be more natural. Um, people should be um, willing to collaborate. So. Maybe that's also a problem uh, of, of, I don't know, of the employees. Um, maybe they are not used to, to collaborating or um, or they don't really want to collaborate. So, of course, as I was saying, UX is also for people who want to talk to other people. And I don't know, 85% of the time you will be uh, on meetings uh, agreeing things with people. So you have to be able to talk to everyone and to try to uh, empathize and to be able to talk um so yeah i think that's very important yeah because when it when there's issues about not being on the same page i think that usually signals a communication problem so it may not mm -hmm. be to do with teamwork like everyone's working on the team but no one's really understanding so it's really important for like teams to communicate effectively and to make sure that everyone actually does understand um because again i guess well with ux and ui i think they they are both one of the same things, but it can be um, confusing if one person on the team gets the communication and interprets it differently than someone else does. So that's why it's probably really important for teams to figure out ways to understand each other, um, not just pretend to understand, but to actually get it. Um, that can happen so often, and it's probably something that's really normal. Like. Uh, there's probably no uh, like organization out there that gets communication like 100% perfect because I think humans in general, we all communicate and understand things differently. So no one's going to have the same mind and the same vision, but there are different ways to kind of work together through either like collaborative design sprints or weekly and daily standups. These are kind of like kind of like rituals that happen in the workplace, depending on if it's agile or not, on how to communicate what needs to be done, uh, why it needs to be done, understanding user stories, all these little bits of pieces of information can help teams to understand what the user is going through and to understand in very simple, clear terms what it is that developers are supposed to be doing and what are designers supposed to be building. So um, not every organization does this right. So don't worry if like your team is like not perfect. It's something that, uh, again, is a challenge in most organizations. Um, okay, McMuffin Man says, I'm starting my first day on Monday. Congratulations, yay. Yay. It's a work from home. 
I'm quite excited and a bit curious on how the day-to-day -day basis actually entails. Any tips and pointers on what daily life of a work from home designer <coughs> looks like just so I can properly prepare more. Oh, I have something to say about that. Um, <laughs> talk okay. to your oh. team. That's the first thing. Like I know people ask mm, us, yeah. like, what do I should expect? Definitely ask that to your team. Ask them what you should expect because your team will have expectations about how you should be managing your time because again you're not in the office they can't see you so if they expect you to answer emails or slack chats uh, a certain way definitely find out from your team what they expect of you um, that's where I would start do you have anything to add to that Julieta yes um, I would I would say that first of all um, try to have one-on-one -on -one meetings with everyone uh, which will I mean, with your core team at least to understand um, what their day-to-day -day looks like, um, and try to try to see how your work will fit in with the already existing uh, structure and processes of the company. Um, try to understand what is asked of you, how uh, they are going to be working. For example, at my company, we are currently working with um, three-week sprints. At first, we were working with two-week sprints. So uh, try to understand how you will be going to distribute your time um, because it would happen. It will be difficult at first. Uh, but try to imagine how, the, like, the to see the big picture. Like, how does your two-week uh, work on a certain project will align with the rest of, of the company's uh, expectations? Um, maybe there's a bigger roadmap which you can take a look uh, to, to see uh, if there are any important dates or um, deadlines that you have to take into consideration. Um, but first, try to, try to start small, I would say. Try to really understand uh, the, the tools that you're going to be using. For example, right now, we're using uh, Jira or Jira, I don't know. Um, so try to understand uh, what your, your day will look like. For example, if you if you have a task to do, um, try to understand how the company is going to to know that you're currently working on it or that you have finished it. Uh, so, for example, on J on Jira, you have to like move the task from one column to the next one to let people know uh, how how your work is going. Um, and I would say the most important thing is to ask questions. Whatever you think uh, you're not sure about, please, please don't think that it's a stupid question because you will have a lot of questions, not only about uh, what tools to use, uh, how to distribute your time during the day, how to distribute your time during, uh, I don't know, the, the whole sprint. Um, you will probably have a lot of meetings. I'm also working from home. It's always been uh, that way, remote, fully remote. So. Try to also, ah, a very important tip, uh, block your calendar. I, I'm sure you will have uh, a common calendar for the whole um, company. So uh, block your time in order to not have uh, uh, constant meetings because of course meetings are important and you need to have them, but there's a lot of you can um, solve through Slack or as asynchronously. You don't have to have uh, meetings for everything. So try to also respect your own your own times uh, and your mental health because uh, it, it can become a lot if you have to be like uh, having back-to-back uh, -back meetings and you can actually uh, start doing the job you have to do. So try to find a balance between these two things and if you found it if you find it uh, hard to do so, ask for help as well. Uh, ask for help. I don't know, maybe for human resources help or your team leader or the person who is, uh, I don't know, uh, closer to you and ask them how they organize their own times and their schedules and their calendars. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, ask for help and ask questions. So that's the two most important things. Yeah, definitely. I agree with that. And with the qu thing about questions, I know a lot of the times when we're new and we join a job we think ah, I don't want to do anything dumb on the job I, I don't want to look yes. like I'm not doing anything right 
but it's totally mm-hmm. okay to ask the dumb questions because <laughs> it's it's yeah it's actually expected it, of you yeah exactly it's what ex- it's it, i mean it, if you mm-hmm. if you don't ask questions uh you won't be able to do your job mm-hmm. exactly it's impossible it, to not have questions it, it and, can also mean that you don't care enough if you don't ask questions so i would say start asking questions from the very beginning yeah definitely and it's also the responsibility of your employer to make sure that they're providing you the space to do your job. So if there's something missing that you don't understand, like it's okay to just say, hey, I'm a little bit confused about this. Can you maybe explain this for me? Or maybe there's some missing information that they're not giving you. Just be like, hey, you know, can you provide me some guidance with this? I'm not sure I understand. It's really important mm-hmm. to just say what, what you understand and what you don't understand because it's yeah. it's – it's it's about good communication. You don't want to say yes, I understood when you don't. Just definitely mm-hmm. be honest about what you don't get, and let your team uh, meet you halfway, right? And yeah. McMuffin uh, Man, uh, yeah, I, go on. Sorry, I, I just need to to talk about something that happened to me in like my my first two weeks. Um, my product owner was not very clear on what I had to do, or I didn't really understand what I had to do or what she wanted from me. Um, so for, I, I think one or two days, I was completely stuck and I felt very anxious because I, I, I thought that if I asked for help, I was going to, to be like, yeah, to be dumb or like should know better. Um, and so like for one or two days, I felt awful. (laughs) And, and then I was asked like, what's happening because you haven't done what you said you would do. Um, and, and then I tried to talk to someone else and when I talked to someone else, everything, uh, became clearer and and my anxiety went away. But what I'm trying to say is that, uh, sometimes the people who is going to give you your tasks in a way to, to tell you what you have to do, maybe they are not, uh, prepared to, to lead a team of people or don't really understand how to talk, uh, to employees and maybe have uh, expectations that don't align with you being a new person in the company. Um, so if you feel that you're not really understanding what they want from you, talk to someone else uh, that can help you and, and that can uh, maybe work as a link between, for example, your product owner and you. Um, because it, in, sometimes it's, it's just uh, a thing of... Um, of understanding how other people work. Um, I don't know, maybe this person isn't very used or is new at her job. I think this was the case that uh, the product owner was new to her job. So it was also hard for her to uh, work with new people or to, I don't know, give uh, instructions to new people and to feel that confidence. So um, this was like, this was a difficult situation because I had only been in the company for two weeks, but the bird owner had been on her new role for a, a short time as well. So um, if you feel like the person who should be clear is not clear, uh, ask someone else. Uh, there's no there's no re- real problem there, but try to be as clear as possible. That's what I'm trying to, to say here. Um, I, I always try to be as clear as possible uh, and to be myself as much as possible. Because uh, if you can't ask questions or uh, if you feel that um, your questions are not received in a positive way, um, that's also a red flag for when you don't want to be. Yeah, exactly. It helps to have a healthy dose of self-awareness to know that you're struggling with something. And then also a bit of confidence to know that, yes, I can contact this person and they will help me. So definitely believe mm-hmm. in your team and believe in the people that are there to help you, that they're there to support you. And they're not going to make mm-hmm. you feel terrible for asking a question. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, so McMuffin says, thank you so much. That was so insightful and informative. Asking for help should definitely be normalized more. Our HR is extremely useful, and they've been working hard to make sure I let out all my questions to alleviate my stresses. In your personal view, what are your expectations for a new hire during the first 30 days? Your advice is so useful. Mm-hmm. Carefully taking notes. Okay. Um I would say that the expectations are that you are able to really get a grasp, first of all, of your of the product you're working on. Uh, for example, in my case, 
I mean, this was not only my first UX role, but also uh, my first role in a cybersecurity uh, industry, which is very specific and, and has a lot of, of difficult aspects. Uh, so at first, I, I realized that I didn't understand most of the things, but what everyone kept, kept telling me, and this is very important, is that um, it will get easier over time and that you have a learning curve to, to go through and that you can uh, rush that. Uh, you have to actually be on the job and, and sort of absorb things as you move uh, forward. And it, it's just a thing, uh, it's just a question of time, I think. So yeah, as I said, I, I, would, I would expect uh, a new person to ask a lot of questions to try to understand how the product works, how the business works, uh, which, uh, which are our user needs, our business needs. Um, of course, also try to understand what the structure of the company looks like, what the different teams are. For example, I have a data team that I could work closely to. I have a marketing and sales team, well, to which I can ask questions whenever I have doubts uh, of how to write a certain uh, piece of copy. Um, try to understand uh, what, what the structure of the company looks like and where you fit in, in all of that. Um, and I would say, yeah, it's just ask questions and, and read all the material because there probably is going to be some sort of onboarding um, uh, process. Uh, ask a lot of questions and just, and just uh, try to immerse yourself as much as possible, but also, as I said, uh, try to take care of your mental health <laughs> because um, maybe you're you're pushing yourself to to be able to to read a lot of things at once or uh, to memorize stuff or you feel like you should know some stuff. And the truth is that you don't you don't have to know that you're in a new person in a new company working with a whole specific bunch of of things. So I would just uh, I would just advise you to be patient with yourself and to uh, go slow. Definitely, totally, 100% agree. Anywho, um, it's about 1.20 p.m. right now. And wow. uh, yeah, it's been a really <laughs> productive session. So we're a little bit over time, but that's okay. Um, really happy that you guys contributed by asking questions. Uh, good luck, McMuffin Man, on your new job. I'm pretty sure you're going to do awesome at it. And uh, sure. yeah, if you guys are interested in participating in another webinar, uh, just scroll up all the way to the top on Discord and you'll see events that are posted. Uh, we have a office hour session with Malik. So if you have any kind of questions and you wanna talk it out with another um, guest uh, TCS mod, uh, he could help you out. He's been a, uh, Malik has been uh, studying uh, in uh, the Google UX course uh, on Coursera. So if you're a part of that course and you have questions, definitely talk to him about it. He's experienced in, in that particular program. We also have another talk uh, on Saturday on October 22nd with Amanda, and she's going to talk about uh, design methodologies. So the differences between agile um, design thinking and lean. So if you're very curious about what those things are and what the heck they mean and what does it look like when a company uses these methodologies, definitely register for that because that's going to be a really cool session. All right. And yes, thank you again. Millions of thanks. If you want to follow Juliet, just look up um, her LinkedIn, which is on the screen. Um, mm -hmm. We also have a link. I think I can grab a link for you guys if you don't mind. Um, or actually, Julie, Julietta, do you have a link to your LinkedIn so that we could um, share it in the chat? Uh, sure. Let me. Yeah, Juliet will find that for you. Sure. In the meantime. Yes, of if course. You... If you have, sorry, <laughs> if you have any questions, please send me a message. Uh, I'll be happy to connect with everyone mm -hmm. and help in any way I can. Absolutely. And this is just one simple favor that I'm asking. If you guys found value in these talks that we have, uh, please consider donating to the Collective Studio. Uh, the money goes towards paying for our uh, server and our domain name, 
our website as well as uh, making sure that we have the right kind of software to use for design sprints. All this stuff helps us to keep this community free and open and so that you guys have the space to do all this stuff. If you feel like donating, just send us something. We'll, we'll appreciate anything. You don't have to, to donate too much if you, if you can right now. Or you could donate a little bit later if, if now is not the right time. But I just posted the link there if you wanted to check it out. And yeah, that's pretty much it. That's all I got to say. Thank you guys for being here. Hope to see you next weekend for our next talk. And yeah, hopefully we'll see you on the text channels as well. If you got any questions, feel free to just talk to us or uh, ping Julie if you want to talk to her, ask a question. We're all here for you. Alrighty. Definitely. Have a good Thank evening. Thank you so much. Or afternoon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.